mean it from from mean it from the Hello, hello. And welcome back to the Boston Commune. This week's incredulous installment will feature commentary from comrades Scott, Ellie, and myself. We'll cover the Jimmy Dore plan, the proletarian dictatorship, situational irony, and disappearing desert dicks. So please, do us a favor and share this content. Do yourself a favor and enjoy your epoch. We choose science over fiction. We choose truth over fact. 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 Feral hogs. 30 to 50 of them. (laughs) Three to five minutes. Bring it back, old beams on the epoch. Yep. We should start a separate. Epochs of your. Yeah, we should start a separate epochs of your, like, social media channel where we're just like, remember that one meme from 2002? There were memes in 2002, like like 9 11 memes. Like, we all love Rudy Giuliani still. (laughs) Those were the memes in 2002. It's just like a picture of Rudy Giuliani. It just says, like, here's Rudy Giuliani. We love him. No, the thing that you were talking about, Scott, like the was thing, like that was basically a meme. I guess you're right. The, uh, yeah, it was, uh, the frogs, the Super Bowl frogs, and then they became the crocodiles. Yeah. The crazy frog. Yeah, crazy frog was his own whole thing. Crazy frog has a penis. He does. He does. Jesus. You know, he's, he's not a frog then, is he? <laughs> frogs just have clackas or whatever. <laughs> you really not? You don't remember Crazy Frog's penis? No, I don't. Can you share it with me? Wait a second. So you're trying to tell me that frogs... The phrase, can you share that with me? <laughs> Do, so frogs ejaculate through their cloaca? <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, like, that's what most animals that have cloacas do. Like, birds, they just touch cloacas. That's how it works. They don't make the rules, Jesse. No, but that's true. Birds do that. It's gross. So does these, like, there's a type of snail that does it, too, and they, like, expand their col- cloacas, like, three feet. It's crazy. What? That's crazy. Yeah. Most snails just, like, wrap around each other and oh, pierce, fuck. pierce each other with their... Yeah. Alien bears. Yeah. What? Pro- frogs do have cloacas. Nail frogs do have cloacas. Yeah, but the original crazy frog had that little... Thing there, and like the European parents were like, What the fuck is that? Which I agree, like, what the fuck? <laughs> European parents are like, Boobs are fine, but not that. Boobs are fine, but would not do anything that. for boobs, but I won't watch that. I would do anything for frogs, but I won't do that. Frogs no, are cool. I won't do that. Oh, yeah, I just looked at a real. <laughs> Frog colica, a male colica. <laughs> yep, true, Scott. Nature's weird. Anyways, <laughs> it's been billions of years of evolution to get to the point where it is. This actually could be seen as a uh, engineering perfection. I don't know. I think it's pretty cool. I think duck penis is cool. Duck penises are the best. Uh, should we worry about that? <laughs> What? How it just came in now with the recording? One of them had it, and then the other one also picked it up. Do a little handoff. Weird. Tag team. Hey, at least that's, you know, secure. Yeah, we don't need to keep talking about frog penises. Uh, we don't indeed. Carlene asked me, she was like, if there's no Joe there, how the, how, who's gonna Joe off? Oh, shit. That's true. I guess, like, technically, there would not be a Joe off this episode. But I had <laughs> planned this whole thing that I was gonna call it. And Joe, and then be like, "Oh wait, he's not here." And then I was going to call on myself, and right, speak, we can pretend we can speak in right. a different voice, a news we'll voice, back. a newsman we'll voice. But <laughs> I can't, I couldn't find a good place to transition into it, so it's okay. It's fine. We don't have to. I'm just going to tear down my own yeah. fa- facade. I'm Orson Welles over here with a F for fake. I'm just tearing down my own facade. Um, yeah, we don't have Joe this week, so I'm going to be doing the news. Uh, I guess we can start with something I have the least amount of things to say about, which is. Well, two things I have the least amount of things to say about, which is one, uh, Mr. Mayor Pete is now the cabinet secretary to the Department of Transportation, which is insane. Like, I don't know how anybody else feels about this, but like, it would make sense if he was, it, like, wouldn't it be great regardless of him being in the cabinet, but like him being a 
the like Department of Defense secretary like at least makes sense. That's his background. And yeah. like people have been looking at like the public transportation record in South Bend, which like doesn't really have public transportation. And like Buttigieg's record with public transportation is pretty atrocious. So and now he's in control of the the, the country's national transportation. And we all know how bad it is in some states. It might just get worse. It is going to. Uh, <laughs> how do you think he feels about it? Like, hi, hi, hopes, Pete. You know, you were going to be the president and now you're just he's the happy that it's it. Like, here's the thing. is He's happy because now he has this on his resume that isn't explicitly tied to his military career. And so he can come off as a little bit more like, le- like less kind of gnashing teeth in like a like a warmongering sense and a war hawk sense because it's like oh like he didn't act like when he was started working for biden he wasn't just doing military shit he was actually trying to do like domestic stuff and so that's gonna look good for his record and so like he's just creating his track to being the the white gay obama that he wanted to be so this is like he probably feels great about this you know, like he he accepted uh, the 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 call originally to count out to Biden and, and drop out of the the primary, and so he's probably loving this too. He's getting everything he wants. He didn't really want to be pre- like I don't think um, the majority of the people who ran for president actually wanted to be president, like the Dems I'm talking about. I think a lot of them were just there to be either they wanted cabinet positions or they wanted to just ruin like the far left chance of gaining ground. Uh, Pete was a part of that project, and so it. it this is a continuation of that project. So I think he's, he's happy as a clam, honestly. Yeah, Klobuchar was just there for the for the fuck of it, I think. <laughs> she was, yeah. she was just, just driving the Klobuchar machine all over that. I, I know I've brought it up before, so I'm sorry. But you guys really should watch Chris Fleming's uh, Amy Klobuchar impressions. I'll, I'll post something in the, in the chat. It's amazing. They're going to make Klobuchar the, de- the secretary of weather. Because <laughs> of her hair in a blizzard. Yeah. <laughs> Also, the stimulus still sucks. Uh, it's not really a surprise there. Might be better. You know, it's not going to be. But these these clowns? No, no. Anyways. These, these clowns. So I guess this is the time where I talk about the Jimmy Dore plan, which, like, is, is pretty pretty stupid. I have a lot of ideas on the Jimmy Dore plan, but that's my, uh, that's my boil it down. It's a pretty stupid plan. Basically, in essence, people like Jimmy Dore, other pundits, uh, Rihanna Joy Gray from Current Affairs, uh, formerly Bernie's press secretary, excuse me, they've been calling for the squad, the now-expanded squad, to basically withhold their vote confirming Pelosi in a hope to force her to force a vote for Medicare for All. And the problem with this plan is that like, we know Medicare for All is going to either die in the Senate or it's going to be vetoed by Biden. And like the House and Senate are so close right now that if like people withhold their vote confirming Pelosi, we will either get a Republican or we will get a Justice Worth Dem as Speaker, which like, hey, I don't know what we're going to get out of that. But also like the, the goal of this, the reason why people want to do this is to expose the Democrats who don't support Medicare for All. And the thing is, like, we we kind of we don't have it on record. We don't have it on paper. I understand. I see what you're trying to do, but at the same time, we kind of already know from people's records. We kind of already can tell who isn't on our side and who is by like you know again like their record or the people that they associate themselves with or like the type of power that they are seeking or what they do with their power. Like we can tell. So like throwing this hail mary pass where we could lose things and we could turn a lot of fucking people against us. It just doesn't really make sense to me. What we should have been doing and what we should always be doing is primary these motherfuckers, get people who are dyed in the wool, Medicare for all supporters in our government from the beginning, you know, and have a stronger like social apparatus from like a worker's apparatus, like a sort of, you know, like I've said, a worker's party, even though the reality of that is pretty far away, but like have a stronger apparatus outside of the Dems, outside of like the channels of government that can put pressure on the Democrats, can, can put pressure on the institutions of capital and the institutions of government that they try to support or that they get money from, like put pressure on these things, boycotts, those things like this vote calling for this vote and people who call AOC or people in the squad, like a sellout for not doing it. It's like, you're not really thinking through what this, like the ramifications of if this goes wrong. I, uh, but again, I want to like, if you agree with the plan, like I can, I can understand where you're coming from and I can respect you for that, but I just don't see, I don't see it working in any material way. 
even if it works, it doesn't gain us any material. It doesn't gain us anything that we don't already have. And so I'm just a little perplexed. I'm a little not in favor of it. And plus, Jimmy Dore is an asshole who still traffics in that, like, if I can swear in the most, like, flamboyant way and be the most, like, jaded Gen Xer about, I can about politics, and that means I have the best position. Like, Jimmy Dore still traffics in that type of bullshit. That is how he engages with politics. He's not really a person to be taken seriously because of that. I wonder if Gen Xers take him seriously. I don't know. I, I mean, like, he has an audience. He's popular with a lot of people, and I just, I get it. Like, he, he gets, he, he's a, you know, he gets anger out there. He gets frustration out there. He throws out radical ideas, but, like, a lot of them, like, you have to think about, like, where we are materially and, like, how the actual fucking numbers, like, if we had, like, a more robust representation or, like, there were more Dems in the, the House and Senate, I would say, like, yeah, do it. Because we have the power to back it up, but we don't right now, you know? And I understand, yes, the Democrats don't really represent us, but at the same time, like, at the end of the day, like, you can't try, because there's that post-left tendency of people who think that we can get these things through, like, Republican action, which is like, no, at the end of the day, the Republicans really just care about capitalism and racism. We're not going to get gains that way either. So I I can totally understand and sympathize, or at least empathize, I should say, with people who like Door, but it's a type of impassioned engagement with politics that doesn't really come with any sort of, like, material understanding to really undergird it or make it meaningful as a sort of, as a commentary on what's happening right now. I liked Door for a little while myself, but, like, just the more I watched him, the more I realized, like, and it wasn't just, it was, you know, partially inspired by majority report but like just the more you watch the door the more you realize like he's kind of he acts like a teenager when he when it comes to politics still and it's just like come on man come on man gotta get those gains gotta get them come on man it's hard to host and do the news and do all the sound drops and everything at once but it's fine i love it i love it so yeah uh that's the jimmy door plan which probably shouldn't be called the jimmy door plan it also seems like a type of thing that like in a week or so we'll move on to the next thing that we're all fighting about online and we'll forget about this and like it'll go by anyways and everyone will be like oh yeah right remember when we were talking about that so you know it's just another leftist fighting leftist infighting online just another instance of that another day in paradise <laughs> yeah and we're we're a gossip we're a gossip. Wow, I just combined two words there. We're a gossip podcast now. It's, it's strictly. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, The last thing I want to talk about is this kind of liberal tendency. And I don't know, Jesse, what your your thing is going to be after this, but it's just something that I've noticed, not even noticed recently. But there's like there's like prominent liberals have been calling for the arrest of Trump because, you know, as Deborah Messing put it, she wants Trump to have a boyfriend in prison. And it's like the liberal attitude of like the only way that we can achieve justice or we can like square the circle. Liberal idea of justice is basically retribution, which isn't justice. That's not. That's not revenge is not making something whole. It's causing more damage. Justice is making something whole. And so calling for somebody, regardless of how bad they are, to be raped in prison, it's a pretty ugly thing to say. It's also a thing that a lot of people said about black people in the 90s. So let's not black males in the 90s. So let's not perpetuate that also. Um, so, yeah, liberals are gross. Deborah Messing sucks. <laughs> Thank God she's not uh I don't even know. What, was, what show was she from? Um, like Will was and she Grace? Will and, Will and Grace? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really learned something from Will and Grace. Yeah. I mean, that's the, the shitty thing is... Okay, so to be fair, I really enjoy Fiddler on the Roof, the musical. And there's one line in uh, If I Were a Rich Man that I always come back to, which is where he's like, you know, if I were a rich man, the most important men in town would come to fawn on me. They would ask me all these questions, like, as if I were Solomon the Wise. And then it, there's the last line of that stanza is like, and it won't make one bit of difference if I answer right or wrong. When you're rich, they think you really know. And yeah, there you go. Deborah Mustang. <laughs> Deborah Mustang and every fucking actor who is like a respected participant in the discourse because they must know shit because they know how to act. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Mark Hamill. Mark Hamill. Piece of shit online. You let me down, Luke. <laughs> You let me down. (laughs) It doesn't actually provide any credit to him because it was a written version of him that he played. But I really love the version of him from that one episode of The Simpsons where Homer is like the mayor's bodyguard. and uh, and, All Star uh, Wars version of Guys and Dolls. Yes. Yes. (laughs) 
Luke, be a Jedi tonight. Yeah, yes. and he, he played Just be a and Jedi he... tonight. <laughs> Classic, classic. That was a good episode. Did this just in? Old Simpsons are good. Yes, if you didn't know, now you know. No, but I, I'm also mad at Luke for appearing as a Force ghost in uh, Rise of Skywalker and basically given dialogue that basically discredited everything he said in Last Jedi. Oh my God, I don't want to talk about that. Yeah, that's an avenue that uh, we're, we're not going to go down tonight. So it's not only Mark, but it is Luke I am disappointed in. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you, Luke. <laughs> You ain't walked on any skies. What the fuck you talking about, Luke? Yes, he's just sitting over there like, nope, not going to say anything. I just don't know what the fuck you guys are talking about. We run a tight ship. It's okay. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> this is a Star Wars podcast now. <laughs> this is a leftist gossip and Star Wars podcast now? <laughs> yes. Uh, this is a struggle session now. Anyways, uh, Jesse, do you want to do your segment, sir? Okay, I'm Jesse, and this is Rabbit Radlib. Hold on, I'm going to do, hold on. I like that. <clears throat> Hold on a second. I'm Jesse, and this is Rabbit Red Lab. Hell yeah. Oh yeah. Rabbit, 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 so I'm going to start with a poem. Ahem. Who decided tanky is the dopest insult as of late? I'm just a comrade open to the notion of a worker state. I had a proper segment planned, but music came into my head. Listeners, please understand, I wrote you this whole poem instead. Why are libs and anarchists so hostile on the internet? Do they really think that Marxists constitute the greatest threat? I've been reading Luxembourg and mispronouncing... Fuck. (laughs) (laughs) Didn't mispronounce fuck there. (laughs) I've been reading Luxembourg and mispronouncing German words. Who is Vosh? He seems absurd. A bearded pedo, so I've heard. Now I'm scared the MBTA service cuts are permanent. If the weather lords bring snow, the proles must gather and repent. Biden is a piece of shit. Fuck the whole new cabinet. Mayor Pete, head of transit. The future is too bright. I quit. That's actually pretty good. That was beautiful. That legit was very, very good. Okay, but um, for real. So I had time. I actually wrote a thing. Um, Last Tuesday, we spoke about white supremacist conspiracy theories. And I think it's important that we recognize the weight of conspiracy theories across the entire political spectrum. As I've mentioned in previous episodes, liberals tend to embrace rhetoric of science and evidence. Biden himself said, quote, truth over facts and science over fiction. Wow. Yep. Throwback. <laughs> this... <laughs> I can't fucking believe that happened. This focus on objectivity, on material reality, is almost meaningless in the modern political context, but this wasn't always so. Dialectical materialism was developed in part as a means of challenging the dogmatism of theocracy, challenging the divine right of kings, and deconstructing justifications for systemic oppression. While many of the stories that we tell ourselves in America generally speaking, are rooted in Christian nationalism, there are secular equivalents. When the neoliberal model begins to fall apart, when cracks begin to show in the fantastical individualism at its core, those who have internalized such ideology will latch onto whatever lore is offered them in order to explain away failures. When no coherent narrative presents itself, in lieu of that safety blanket, the media class defaults to waving such failures off as an aberration rather than a consequence. There are kernels of truth in many conspiracy theories, as shared class interests often merit or resemble conspiratorial behavior. There is indeed a relatively small group of powerful men heavily influencing very consequential policy decisions. Vulnerable people have been surreptitiously subjected to inhumane experimentation. Democratic processes have been sabotaged through espionage. For Christ's sake, the men who stare at goats was written about an actual CIA program. To cut to the chase, there is a liberal version of QAnon, and it's called Russiagate. There is also, admittedly, a certain left-wing version of Holocaust denialism, and that is the denial of the Ukrainian famine, of which a sensationalized version is called Holodomor, or denial of the current-day Uyghur concentration camps in China. I want to be clear about this. I would much prefer the scientific method over a faith-based alternative. We must be wary, however, about who is performing the experiment, at what cost, and to what end. Even the most well-intentioned scientific ventures can harbor systems of oppression, as is the case with, for instance,
instance Kitt Peak, America's first national optical observatory, which was built on the land of a federally recognized sovereign indigenous tribe called the Tohono O'odham Nation, which is in Arizona. Lastly, I'd like to point out that we too practice a kind of faith, for we are guided by our belief in the possibility of a stateless, classless society, and we are fueled by faith in each other. That's a good point. Hell yeah. That's it. <laughs> cool. Yeah, you got it. You got it. Uh, it's real good. Very deep on certain things I haven't thought about in a while. Uh, yeah, the men who stare at goats. I still need to see that. That movie does not exist. <laughs> Is that, that was, another conspiracy theory? I'm not really sure what the fuck happened with that because, like, I feel like I would have to watch it again to decide how I feel about it. All I remember is, like, when it was over, I hadn't really texted my mom in a while and I texted her and I was just like, I just watched Met The Men Who Stare at Goats and, like, I don't, I don't know how I'm feeling right now. <laughs> uh, see, yeah, no, that's what I mean is that it's a movie where you're just like, oh, and then it just kind of, like, leaves your brain after that. It just doesn't exist. <laughs> But I mean, the same thing happened to me with like Napoleon Dynamite. Like the first time I saw it, I was like, what the fuck is this? Oh, and then the second time I that's saw it. That's a movie I wish didn't exist. The second oh, time I saw no. it, I was, like, I was like, this is like a whole new genre of theater. Like, I don't even know what the fuck. Like, it I don't. It's revolutionary. It was yeah, incredible. Like, it was like it opened up my eyes to like, none of it was funny. But as a whole, it was fucking hilarious. It was so perfect. Yes, yes. And you know who made that movie? Mormons. What? I don't know if that has anything to do with how it was, but it's a fact. It was made by Mormons. That's brilliant. <laughs> no joke. Like, I saw that in theaters when I was 16, and it, like, changed my life. <laughs> It is so stupid. It's like so pointless and stupid. But like you said, as a whole, it's just like it's its own thing. You know, it's like this whole thing that I don't know. I I really loved it. It was so weird. It was so weird. I think the reason that I would be willing to give Men Who Stare at Goats like a second go through is because Burn After Reading gets better every time I watch it. And it was the same guys. That's another one I still haven't seen. I think Burn I mean, well, I mean, Stare at Goats was... was Produced by the Coens, yeah, but not. Anyways, but yes, Burn After Reading is a great movie. It's very good. It's very funny. I definitely so like <laughs> fell in love with the Coens in college and was like, I like the Coen brothers now because that's what every even film studies adjacent person in college does. And then I was like, I'm going to see all their movies. And then I would be like, oh yeah, there's a new one. And I just wouldn't see it. <laughs> and I still haven't seen those ones. I really want to be nitpicky right Do now. It. <laughs> Like, a lot of people use the word irony. Nitpick. But they don't know what the fuck it means. Like, there's multiple kinds of irony, but one so. sort of genre of irony is situational irony. Jesse and is so close to one of my hobby horses right now. I love this. <laughs> and Go like, off. <laughs> like, the Coen brothers, in essentially all of their films, are, like, driven by situational irony. Like, incomplete information for the characters in the film but the audience has complete information and like right. that's what makes it fucking it's like like it hurts when you're watching it but it's like a good kind you know like the experience is like it's just so fucking absurd but it's it's driven by like it's the absurdity of of everybody completely misinterpreting the plot in yeah. relation to everybody else and it all of that is then directly mirrored by like the very stark and like very direct black and white portrayal of violence that they do but it's just it creates like the most bizarre like there's this weird sense of like ironic justice in coen brothers movies that like i don't know if i would say i uh it interests me but it's 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 so fucking dark i don't know it's just this level of bleakness that is like really honest <laughs> yeah i definitely I, fe- I when i was watching burn after reading like the character developed like it's a comedy like it's a dark comedy but it's like really depressing like it is it is like soul suckingly depressing and hilarious simultaneously yeah that's actually a perfect way of putting it (laughs) yeah and that's a great combination really i mean i don't know if great great is a pretty neutral word (laughs) it's like a very particular combination and if you watch burn after reading you'll totally get it because like all of the characters are like so pathetic but they're also like so fucking unaware of like their situation well well, except for brad pitt like brad pitt in that film the coen brothers love he's the only one who's happy yeah, yeah like, that's why he's funny. To make Brad Pitt and George Clooney look like fucking morons, which is. I love that, but I mean, fuck. I don't know. Like, I, I'm not gonna do one of those like sp- cut spoiler, cover your ears. Spoiler, he gets sh- shot in the head halfway through the movie. Yeah, he dies. Like, <laughs> and it's the funniest moment. <laughs> I know. 
like, he's like happy to be killed. It's so funny. <laughs> yeah, it's like like when you talk about like ironic justice, it's like the sheer reverse of justice. But at the same time, it's like nobody else could have died in that way in that film. Like it only he's made- like he's the only character that has like any positivity or like feels good about himself. Like regardless of what happens to him, like the character is always a positive. He's like the least. Oh my god. He's like the least to blame for anything that's happening in the plot, and he's the only one who gets shot in the head. It's great. You know what this is making me think of? I know that, Jesse, you weren't on the thing we Scott and Will and Joe and I recorded last week about acid communism, but we were definitely talking about, like, Joe getting abducted by aliens for some reason, and we were, like, definitely all in agreement that if Joe got abducted by aliens, he would, like, not even... He would fight them. He would fight them. He would just, like, be sarcastic at them and, like, not even give a shit, and I'm getting, like, big Joe being abducted by alien vibes from... I haven't seen this scene that you're talking about. This is where my mind is going. Oh, and the uh, the device that Clooney builds. What a weird fucking movie oh, that yeah. is. <laughs> That's the moment in that movie when, like, they reveal what it is that he's building, where, like, if you're into it, you are, like, like, that's the moment where you're, like, one of the best movies the Coen brothers have done, that's it. If you're not into it, you're, like, this sucks. Like, that is the moment when they reveal what he made. (laughs) We're a Coen brothers podcast now. That combined with his just, like, off-the-chain paranoia is chef's kiss. Ellie, uh, assignment, you should watch this movie. Yeah, I actually literally just wrote it down on my very... Very, very long list of movies that I need to watch. Hell yeah. And I'm not like right a big here. movie buff guy. Like, there is something very special about the dark comedy of the Coen brothers. Yeah, I mean, that's why they're so big. That's why they are so famous. And if you like the more darkness of their like movies like No Country for Old Men, I would suggest watching their first movie, Blood Simple, because it's like, the way to describe, I would describe it is it's like, it's No Country for Old Men, but it has this sense of comedy that their more comedic films have. It's It's very bizarre. It's well. It's not very bizarre. It's just. It's a very interesting mix. It's. It's. It's really compelling how in that film you can see like everything that they're going to do in the rest of their career. Uh, so I'd highly su- the like the two movies that I've now suggested. Yeah. Yeah. Ellie, do you also have things we can't make up? I do. Um, if we can I'm, transition? Yes. I'm going to also transition from using my phone to my computer. So give me just a minute. Jesse, did you have any last words about the Coen yeah. Brothers? <laughs> I was just going to say, yeah, I don't think it's the Coen Brothers, but Thank You for Smoking is another really good dark comedy. And yeah, I always think of it because the, uh, I think he's like the CIA director in uh, Burn After Reading plays like this, <laughs> just like heartless tobacco exec in Thank You for Smoking. Okay. And then Rob Lowe, who's playing the uh, the movie producer who just, like, never sleeps and wants every, like, movie scene to have characters smoking. Holy shit. I'm just That's seeing the movie. crazy frog right now. And you're right. He definitely has a dick. I don't know why. I don't know why this happened. Anyway. <laughs> I like his spots, though. Oh, yeah. Those are tasteful. I'm pretty sure Crazy Frog is French, so it might explain things. Mm-hmm. He's definitely a European of some kind. I think French might be correct. Jason Reitman did, did Thank You for Smoking, the director of June. Yeah, how about that? Yeah. Tell me some things that can't be made up. You can be Well, y'all, it's it's monolith time again. We've got monoliths, boys. Not again. We've got so many monoliths. Mono boy. So all right, so that so there's a monolith that popped up in Atascadero, California. I think actually what happened was, you know, we all we talked about the one that was in Utah. Sounds like there was also one that was discovered in Romania, which was very similar to the one in Utah. You know, it's tall and metal and skinny or whatever. Nobody knows what the fuck those were about. Then there was discovered discovered another one in Southern California and there was one in Germany as well. <laughs> German news agency DPA reports that the pillar, one of many so-called monoliths that have appeared without explanation around the world in recent weeks, uh, it was destroyed. The one in um, Germany was destroyed and it sounds like the one in California was removed. Blah, blah, blah. I don't know if anyone really cares about like how these things got taken down. Cause like I that's do. not, I'm, that... I'm, I'm interested. I want to okay, know. Okay. All right, cool. I'm I'm glad you let me did know. they get were they were they impounded were they were they did somebody uh <laughs> somebody uh uh, uh <laughs> <laughs> they're sold for <laughs> scrap <laughs> Oh, shit. Well, the one in Germany, actually, literally, it says it was reduced to scrap. 
But it doesn't say who did it. Apparently, they took so reductionist. Hey, boss, what do we do with the rare monolith? (laughs) (laughs) The other part of the story is that also in Germany, there was a a large wooden sculpture of a phallus that I think was already in the mountains in Bavaria, and it disappeared mysteriously. But then, just days later, another large phallus sculpture appeared in the same place. (laughs) And it was even featured on Google Maps, where it was described as a cultural monument. I saw that. Also, I really have to give this AP writer credit because they, they wrote the sentence, The sculpture toppled over several weeks ago, only to be erected again. Hell yes. Hell yes. Yeah. It's the end of the other side of the wind when the giant penis falls down. <laughs> that happens in the other... other s- in the what? The other side of the wind, the movie that Orson Welles didn't finish, that, that Netflix finished. At the, um, the last scene is is uh, a woman puncturing a giant uh, inflatable penis and then it collapses. Awesome. Yeah. There's some symbolism yeah. That's, for you. Does that signify any... Is there any thematic elements? Uh Gives the yeah, I mean, like guy. it's it's happening in the movie within the movie, which is about like womanhood and masculinity. It's all uh, I don't like the uh, other side of the wind. It's not a very good movie. It was for a movie that like was in production for forty years. It still feels like it was rushed together. So <laughs> no, but here's the thing about those monoliths: is at the end of, of the novel three thousand one, they get to the the planet moon of Europa, Jupiter's moon, and mm. the like. They're sending out millions of monoliths throughout the galaxy. Uh, so that's what's happening right now. They're all coming from Europe, it, bro. It does the the mind control and it gives the monkeys the smartness, right? Is that what happens? Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's a it's a communication slash uh, evolutionary tool. Holy shit! I'm realizing that the plot of Interstellar and 2001 are very similar. Never mind. Jesus. <laughs> so we're a movie that's podcast that's now. We have been missed in the bud. <laughs> if that's what uh, happens, I quit. <laughs> Oh, we're not a movie podcast. I would start another podcast before making this a, po- a movie podcast. No, seriously, I've thought I about this. I would about doing communism and eating ass. <laughs> well, we're all at ass. No, we aren't. <laughs> but never. <laughs> we got to keep our priorities straight. Fighting for com- communism and then always having ass to eat. Yes, you got to have two cop things. Can't have scarcity of ass. No, but I'm just letting you know, uh, one producer to the other. I have thought about it. If I ever wanted to make a movie podcast, I would start something that was separate from this before turning this into that. So don't worry. Okay. All right. Thought uh, you used to be on a movie podcast, right? Yeah. What's don't look for it. Okay. I don't know. I don't talk to any <laughs> of the people who used to be on it. <laughs> All right, then. <laughs> from former life. I don't want to. Anyways. <laughs> When your name a was tender subject, whatever your name is backwards. That's what I, that's what your name was. Then. That's all the monolith news that this fit to print on the AP website. Did you just have monolith stories? Well, yeah. I mean, I had monolith stories, and I had the story about the giant dick. Right. That's what I got this week. Actually, two two monoliths. Ooh. Multiple. It was like fucking Different like four types. of them. Four of the shiny kind, and then two of. We the, got all these. We got them all. <laughs> All these erections going up everywhere. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I guess because we're going to keep this, because, you know, keeping it a short one, punchy one. <clears throat> um, sorry. I don't know why I just turned on my mic for that. I like that. <laughs> I actually, I thought you were going to say something like really profound, like, (laughs) gentlemen. Yeah, no, that was why I apologize. Actually, we should create a society that looks out for the most vulnerable. And we shouldn't give people too much money or too little money, which is the lessons of A Christmas Carol. What? Yeah, that's the lessons of A Christmas Carol. Oh, never mind. Christmas Carol's good. It's like pro. No, 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 no. no. (laughs) I was thinking about a Christmas story. Oh, oh. Christmas stories! A Christmas story uh, does also have the lessons that material goods are not like not the point of Christmas, but like it's contained in all but thirty seconds of the end of the movie. So <laughs> the whole rest of the movie is telling you pursue material goods. That's all that matters. Well, I don't like that movie. It's boring as fuck. Also, I want to make you guys watch the Crystal because it's just yet another movie. That's yeah, but I'd like probably like it. Yeah, I think you would. It's fucking great. 
It's a really fucking great movie. And there's also a, a prequel series on Netflix that is surprisingly equally good that tells you. And that that's like a fucking, it's called Age of Resistance. It's no, literally, no, no. it's all about, you know, power struggle and like rape of the earth and shit like that. Oh, y'all know how I feel about prequels, though. Yeah, but yeah, that's, yeah. you know, I was skeptical as well. But then I was pleasantly surprised. I'm literally wearing a Dark Crystal sweatshirt right now. And I had therapy earlier and my, my therapist was like, are those, what are those animals on your sweatshirt? And I was like, oh, these are mystics. They have four arms and they live in a cave. And <laughs> she was like, okay. Live in a cave, you say? Well, they live in a valley. They, they live in a cave. cave. <laughs> they don't live in Dave's caves. In a rat. They live in a cave, guys. <laughs> what are they called again? I don't see them. The mystics. Yeah, no, that would be These great. mystics? If it was in a I rat. believe in God. I can't have this cave with mystics. <laughs> It's, it's another world, another time, in the age of wonder, in Iran. <laughs> in Iran? Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> We're Afghanistan. We kind or of use them, like, interchange. I don't know which country I'm in anymore. For us. <laughs> we were just like, oh, yeah, the, pla- the place with the sand, so. Okay, let's, okay, actually, I'm in the cave from the island uh, in Castaway, which actually makes it very suspicious why I can't get out, but please help me. Yeah, that's a very shallow cave. <laughs> the opening is very large. And Tom Hanks has no difficulty getting out of it and leaving that island. And that goddamn scene where he takes out his tooth, though. Fuck. Castaway is a good movie. Thanks, Dave. Did you watch yes. it on your D- Dave player? Yeah. That you Dave stole my opinion, yeah. <laughs> yes. I have a, a cave TV. And the cave DVDs, I just, like, think about them. And they... I, I find round pieces of stone, Fucking and I just think about them here. as I <laughs> yes, yes. I, I, I through many trials and tribulations, I find the way to imprint to to chisel in the information into these round rock. Have I told you that I've been in here for roughly five hundred years, which is how I've been able to achieve all of this? Is uh, like so. I need uh, help. <laughs> I'm Dave in the cave. I'm not Dave Rubin. I'm Dave in the cave. Oh, Which is okay. an immortal oh. copy of Dave Rubin in a uh, cave. Are you a vampire? Will... No. Okay. Maybe I am. I know because I believe in God. <laughs> <laughs> and I laugh at my own jokes. <laughs> Gotta do something in there. This is this whole narrative is getting This bit's getting weird. <laughs> <laughs> Very twisted. <laughs> yeah, Tom Tom Hanks was also great in Philadelphia, but I still haven't seen the whole movie. I've watched that in several film classes, actually. Yeah, it's a good movie. It's a good movie. Yeah, I just want to say, right. well, say it. <clears throat> I just want to say that I'm confused about like I feel like there's been a pretty significant shift lately to like why are why does everybody hate Marxist Leninists now? Like, what the fuck happened? Yeah, it's a very yeah no, I think uh, it's kind of all right it kind of gets back to like a little bit of what i said earlier like it's this like emergent very hardened like post left tendency that i think is arising or at least getting legitimacy out of the failure of bernie and the uh the ascension of biden that like a lot of post leftists who like reject marxist tendencies and reject leftist tendencies are like saying like hey look see you know like look, look, we told you you're not radical enough and i i think that's where it's coming from partially i don't know but it is a good question like like jesus christ like this movement is built on for the like you know for, like i think even anarchists would agree with this that like a large part of this like ideology and this movement is built on marxism so what the fuck is everybody doing basically like that's why yeah. i say like go back to marxism have at least a, like a good understanding of marxism because that's where a lot of the foundation of what we're trying to do comes from and then like if you want to go and be an anarchist that's fine if you want to do other things that's fine but like have a, an understanding of what marx was saying so this is very peculiar like i i love anarchists i don't know why they hate me so much i don't hate you see oh what yeah. where is this coming from internet it's what i said like it's 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 the thing that i always say that like because nobody has power and because everybody's online all the time it's like they get the opportunity to imagine any scenario and every scenario and convince themselves that like convince themselves that any single scenario that every fictional scenario that they imagine could happen and then they try to pick the most radical position they could have to come out on top of like whatever like radical moral high ground they like have built in their mind and like it's just you get 
get too much time, too much influence from like the the popularity driven aspect of social media mixed with like the frustration of being like a leftist without power in America right now. And I can totally fucking understand that mixed with like you have a lot of time on your hands. It's a pandemic. You're not doing anything like you can imagine anything and you can convince yourself that it's true. And you can, you know, like get the fuck off Twitter, people. Come on. <laughs> Do some other things. Go outside. I mean, I'm not even on Twitter, and, like, I'm still feeling the, like... Yeah, you get it on a, lo- a lot on Facebook, which is, like, just get off social and media. You- YouTube. Why the fuck... How the fuck did it end up on YouTube, dog? What is going on? That's what I say. YouTube is and a who weird is- place okay. for politics. And who <laughs> the fuck is Vosh? Why does pe- why do people care about... Who the fuck is he? Does he he's do- a... He's a left... T- he's a red TV, as they call it. Like... But you... <sighs> Vosh, his whole, like, his, how do I put it? Because uh, there's a lot. Um, his whole thing is like, I don't know if he means the, the best, like, whatever. But like he does a lot of things that divide the left or, like, have qualities that could cause schisms. and so, like, like, he really was the person who got the conversation about, like, class reductionism going. Even though, like, honestly, no one really believes in class reductionism. There's nobody who, like, solely puts every lens through class and nothing else. Like, if you're doing that... Your analysis is bullshit to begin with, you know, Um, like there's that. And like he also tried he's used the writing of Lenin and Marx in like really weird suspect ways to try to get people to like vote for Biden and stuff like he used this. Like, I don't I don't remember. if it was Marx. I did a a rabid Radlibs episode about people like that. Yeah. Like he used the writing of Marx and Lenin to basically argue that like Marx basically said in efforts of fighting the monarchy, if we have to, we can side with the bourgeoisie and Vosh was using that as an argument to side with Biden where it's like Marx then went on and said if there is no monarchy then the bourgeoisie is our enemy and we shouldn't be doing that and that's what Vosh missed is that like that's basically you're basically doing the things that we now have a clear enemy and it's the bourgeoisie why do you want to get in bed with them that's not a justification he used a very specific argument as to a very specific moment where we should be getting into bed with the bourgeoisie and applied it to everything and then like his re- I don't know he's done some shit recently he's just this is the reason I don't like bread tube is that like it's just these okay it's these people who like have some small handful of like legitimate grievances that like totally understand but like they make it their whole identity and then they get on YouTube and then they just make that their politics and that's yeah. what it is it's just it's a couple things that they really care about and then they try given like the nature of like YouTube and the fact that like you got to stay up with the discourse and you got to stay relevant you got to keep your your numbers up like they'll try to apply their you know limited knowledge on the certain aspects of politics that they do know a lot about to everything and then like they get shit like what Vosh does where you're using Marx to argue in favor of voting for a bourgeoisie candidate it's like when re-education said that, oh my God, I'm just talking shit on people. But like, he kind of rejected the notion of the dictatorship of the, or like in general, when people like, he's not the only one, people in general who like reject the notion of like the dictatorship of the proletariat. It's like the point, it, like I understand your, their qualms or your fears of having like the working class run the government. But at the same time, like I trust that representation to more seek to like run the country, run the society, run our society in a way that's more beneficial to people who are also in that material class. Like, I trust that more than, like, people who are entirely detached from what the working class experiences every day. And, like, it's like what Ellie and I were talking about with, like, filmmakers. Like, they become detached from the audience that they're trying to create films for. And I kind of think that, like, it kind of happens with bread tubers as well. And, like, there are good ones out there. Like, we, we've talked about it. Like, non-compete's really good. He stays in touch with everything. Like, but there, but a lot of it, I just, like, eh, you know, it's it's... I don't know. I feel like I, don't he, know. He, I, I really don't have anything bad to say about him. Like he's one of the good ones. Cause I mean, he, I feel like he learns a lot from Luna who is yeah. a lifelong has lived in Vietnam her whole life. So her, she comes from the lineage of Marxists and like, yeah, they're an interesting pair. They're cool. They're dope. I like them. Like, I just want to say like, I don't mean to talk like I just, there's some certain things that I disagree with, but if we're all actually working towards the liberation, the, the revolution and the liberation of the, 
global proletariat, if you're all like legitimately devoted to that project, then like carry on and Godspeed, comrade. Like, even if I disagree with you, don't stop doing what you're doing. So that's what comradeship is all about. Although I will say that if you use Marx to argue for, don't do dumb like, shit like that, though. Yeah, dumb shit like that. Then Marx will not only roll over in his grave, he will keep rolling until he tunnels out of his grave and tunnels to where you live and finds you and like tunnels into your house and fucks you up. Ooh, Marx is a gopher. Marx. Marx yes. is God. Marx is Ghost God. of communism. So Marx is not God. <laughs> also, I do feel... As a communism <laughs> reference. <laughs> I feel like the need to clarify, like the dictatorship of the proletariat doesn't necessarily mean that like you have like the existing government bureaucracy run by people who ostensibly represent the working class. Like, Yeah, it doesn't mean like your fucking mechanic is going to become president. It just means that yeah. all hierarchies are restructured such that like, I mean, the majority of people on earth are working class people so just democratizing that process on whatever level you have to so like any alternative right now to a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie if we can't get to you know horizontalism then having like a lot of us <laughs> like working in a democratic process to get resources to the rest of us is preferable like the idea is that eventually the if you you have like a bunch of people who are working in the public sector that aren't making a ton of money then like there's no need for a public sector you know that's just like society taking care of itself that's the idea hello it's jesse from the future i didn't do a great job of articulating my thoughts while we were recording so i'm going to try and do that now regardless of the form that a government takes whether it be a representative liberal democracy a constitutional monarchy a unitary state what have you those who have less power will be subject to exploitation by those who have more power. The state apparatus is thus not even relevant to the dictatorship that I'm about to describe, and you'll see why. Under capitalism, the economic system we have here in the United States, power is a reflection of capital, money in some form which can be used to generate more of itself. The only way that most of us, as members of the working class, the proletariat, can get our hands on some money is, generally speaking, to sell our labor to someone who already has money, the employer, or the capitalist. Therefore, the the person with more than enough money is the one who decides how we go about our work and what the monetary value of that work is to be. When those with more than enough money continue to turn a profit, growing their wealth and thus their power, they establish themselves as members of a ruling class. We call that class the bourgeoisie. Descendants of members of that class often inherit the wealth and thus the power, which enables them to remain in that class without having to sell their own labor. It should now be clear that the bourgeoisie dictate the behavior of the working class. That's how we arrive at the phrase, the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. However, if we develop institutions of our own, we may be able to rival the power of capital through rivaling the capitalist system on the whole. With immense effort, working class institutions could collectively strengthen and grow to such magnitudes that the bargaining power of the workers overpowers that of the capitalists. Hence, we arrive at the dictatorship of the proletariat. It's a phase of development in which the working class, which constitutes a majority, has more power than the capitalists capitalist class, a minority. Obviously this shift in power would, by definition, change the very nature of the class-based dialectic. Now we can revisit the state apparatus. The workers may populate the offices of government through traditional electoral processes, though such endeavors are arguably most likely to succeed if undertaken through the vessel of a new political party. This does not mean, however, that the dictatorship of the proletariat is synonymous with the unitary state. I sympathize with anarchists who are wary of bureaucracy, and so would advocate for workers' councils elected through direct democracy, if pressed. In the end, it's up to the masses, as the greatest possible outcome for any proletarian dictatorship is the complete dissolution of the state. And that is more of the goal than things like like Medicare for all or whatever. Like the thing, like that's another a thing that I've have had like like half serious conversations about with my brother is that like a lot of the things that we're fighting for right now in terms of like political gains are like sock dem shit. Like Medicare for all is a sock dem thing. Like under a communist government, you wouldn't even have to worry about it because the doctor would be an employee of the state, and so you would just go to the doctor and he'd be like, "What's wrong?" and you'd be like. 
ah, my stomach hurts. And he goes, okay, let's look at it. And then nobody would ever talk about money or a bill ever. Right. And, and that's the thing with Medicare for all. It's like, it's not, that's the Medicare for all is, is, is still supporting the system that we have. <laughs> so basically it's just like increasing the, the pool to the, to the size where like, there's a lot of clients that are still basically receiving services at private institutions, but like people will be getting reimbursed. Yeah. I mean, and it, like, again, social democracy in America would be very good for America. Uh, we're a draconian ass backwards country. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's be real. all right. Yeah. Let's be real. And let's talk about some movies. We've already recommended a bunch. <laughs> Jesus Christ, oh, my man. <laughs> Comrades, God, if you were to watch. This whole episode's been a movie. Anyways, you know, Burn After Reading, Blood Simple, Thank You for Smoking, but the two, and also Dark Crystal, and yeah. it's pretty cool. I'm going to say Dark Crystal. I'll add that to the list. But the two things that I wanted to recommend. Well, one is the is Lover's Rock, uh, another one of these small acts installments. But uh, Sound of Metal, uh, starring Riz Amin, it's a very good film. And Jesse, I think you might like it because it's about a metal drummer who is in recovery, who starts losing mm. his hearing, who uh, like he almost like he, he wants to use again because of his hearing. So he goes into like this recovery program for the deaf, for the deaf, while he's also co- coping with like losing his hearing. So it's about him. Like, like trying to go through recovery while also coping with his loss of hearing. And it's really, it's a great film. It's very gripping. It's very emotionally raw. It's kind of, it's kind of long, but it's very, it's very great. I want to humanize myself right now and say that like, just that description literally gave me goosebumps. Like (laughs) that sounds very intense. So that sounds like a good recommendation. Thank you. Welcome folks. Welcome Jesse. Love you comrade. I love you too, bro. Everybody loves each other. <laughs> on this podcast what is the dark what is the dark crystals prequel called it's called the dark crystal age of resistance it's it's like 10 hours man it's like a whole mini series i would say probably watch the 10 original hours first. of dark crystal it's fucking good it's like injected into my veins good i don't know that's just me whatever can you take it folks 10 hours, <laughs> 10 hours. i mean even if you can't the old the original movie's only like an hour and a half i think so you know also breaking news winter storm coming for boston that's right shit Golf gotta go get the bread and milk repent to your weather lord repent, <laughs> repent. harvey leonard is gonna come to slit your throat <laughs> <laughs> you didn't repent. Really? You get the worst yeah. storm. Oh yeah, what is Weather Underground? Or what's that site that you like, Jesse? Weather's happening? No, I mean like not Weather's happening. The other one is it Weather Underground? The guy, he's funny. He's Boston. Good stuff. That's just weather. That's, that's Weather is happening. You know yeah. that guy? No, 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 no. Not that guy. The other guy. The 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 guy hub. The hub. Oh, Universal Hub. Yeah. Universal Hub. Does All he right, talk about look. Weather? Let me look. Let me look. He's good stuff i mean yes i love weather is happening good stuff also oh there's no weather shit on here never mind oh i imagined it all oh yeah you're talking about the american jazz fusion band weather report (laughs) right because i thought weather underground was also a band for a while but they're not yeah 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 okay so the official word from adam g is gone to four slices slash high because they're bandying about the words nor'easter and near blizzard conditions and the governor himself is warning us to stay inside once night falls on wednesday also eight to 12 inches now forecast on both sides of the mast toast pike oh four slices of toast oh yeah Four slices. the french toast alert system has been developed in consultation with local and federal emergency officials to help you determine when to panic and rush to the store to buy milk eggs and bread yep (laughs) gotta go get the eggs and or the bread and milk the eggs and milk (laughs) get the eggs and the milk yeah it's kind of like the uh, and the bread Waffle House uh, thing, except sort of it's predictive instead of uh, like how bad is the damage kind of thing. Correct. Yeah, that was why I brought it up. (laughs) 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 That's right, folks. Weather is happening is really awesome, though. Definitely check them out. Check him out on any social media or just his website, I guess. Weather is happening dot com. YouTube. He's everywhere. I think he has a red bubble store, too. Oh, does he? Red bubble. I have a Weather's Happening sticker on my laptop. A lot of people have that sticker. Yeah, I've seen it everywhere. He's been around for a while now. Yeah, he has a Redbubble store. Noise. All right, folks. The the tag is Weather is Happening.
happen. <laughs> Weather's happening. Weather's happening. <laughs> Damn, weather, you so happening. They don't think it happened uh, like it is, but it do. Ah, uh, my name is Weather is happening. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. My name is Scott, and I was also Joe tonight. <laughs> Uh, no, I wasn't. We can't replace that lovely cherub. I, um, miss, I miss Joe. We miss him. Miss we him do. Too. Feel better, Scream Joe. Scream into the we void. Love you, Joe. You. Who's gonna Joe off without you? We love <laughs> Joe. It's a very emotional episode. Yeah. Okay. So my name is Scott. You can follow me at the uh, on yeah. So my name is Scott. Jesus Christ, it's fucked up. That really bad. You can follow me on wait, Twitter. Wait. What's your name? What's your name? <laughs> I didn't catch it. I forgot. <laughs> you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Death Mullet. You can find me on SoundCloud at Sweaty Wife. But I'm also going to be moving things <laughs> over to... Sweaty Wife! It's, it's a funny name, but I'm also going to be moving things over to uh, Bandcamp because I'm working on an eight-song album that I have one, all but one song basically completed for. So it takes check it so out. much longer to fucking make music than it takes you, bro. Yeah. yeah I mean, I'm just like sequencing samples. It's, it's it's admittedly very easy, and I. Sounds that's good. why. I, that's why I have a very a reverent, very like kind of jokey attitude towards it because it is so easy, and I can make songs really fast. So yeah, I have like talk about your real music, Jesse. I have like a gauntlet of fucking cables. Uh, <laughs> I'm Jesse, and you can find my music on SoundCloud.com/slash Contingents Boston, and hit up Comrade-Rosie.org. Click Getting Involved, donate to one or more mutual aid groups, and that's time or money. Right now, Austin Bright Mutual Aid, we have more than enough, I guess, labor power, if you want to think of it, to go around, but we're really behind. We have like a big backlog of requests. So, uh, for give our, them money and things, yes. they have enough people <laughs> for our meager audience. I mean, donations, even like a lot of people need shit for their kids for Christmas. So, um, and that's not like, you know, people who have a lot of shit to begin with, like people who are probably going to go to a food bank to get food who also don't have have any money to give their children anything yeah uh, there's actually a lady on uh my somerville next door thing which i subscribe to for funsies oh my god how like, is that it's a fun time i should maybe is it, is it like a drama clusterfuck mm, i mean probably i don't really read the comments enough but i sometimes there's no interesting Carleen. posts like there Carleen, was one that, hmm? sorry i <laughs> I was talking to the cat. <laughs> oh, God damn it. I thought it was Carly. I have my, I have you guys. My volume is down really low so that like your Jesus. audio doesn't go into my mic. So sometimes I can't fucking tell what's going on. Uh, no, next door is pretty funny. There was a post that was like the salt mystery of Foss Park, and it was like I have noticed there's a pile of salt that appears in the same place like every other day, and I, I don't know why. And does anyone know? And there's a whole bunch. Nobody knew, but like there was a whole thing like, oh, I have seen blah blah. blah. There was like a, a whole discussion about it. Hold on a second. I want to get a testimony from Carleen. Here, Carleen, say what happened. You had next door. Um, they made fun of my homeless friend, and I defended him, and then I uninstalled it. Yeah, that's. That's terrible. I think there's a yeah, lot that's of next people door. right there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Somerville is not as bad. There seem to be a lot of nice people. And actually, uh, I brought it up because there was a woman who was like, hey, guys, I'm really embarrassed to be asking this. And it was just like, you know, one next door. And, you know, you can do it. But I think a lot of people don't do it. She was like, I just don't have anything to give my kids. And a whole ton of people responded and were like, I have toys. Or like, do you want to make an Amazon wish list? Or like, you can do this and you can use this resource and yada, yada, yada. And it was wonderful. It's really heartwarming. So even outside of the mutual aid networks, people are coming together and that's communism well, i mean not really we're physically distant but right right you know <laughs> together in the the spiritual sense <laughs> yeah yeah physically distant spiritually connected yeah we literally talked about that for like a solid couple minutes on the acid communism episode yes we strive like, towards like the human instrumentality project. <laughs> yeah quantum entanglement ali do you want to tell us who you are or do we oh i'm i'm some kind of being you know mm-hmm. i'm some kind of, Some kind of yeah i'm ellie uh i don't have a music project but i actually have been working on one so maybe someday i will i don't know it's taking forever because i just haven't been motivated to practice and i'm now becoming one of these like outsider art like free music advocates yeah so, like <laughs> i believe like we should pay I believe that like we should have a social apparatus set up that like we are provided if we want to learn to play instruments 
if we want to learn to make just make songs like how I do on my stupid phone, we should be allowed to. We all get to use the same pool of resources, and that's communism. That's how music would work under communism. That's why it would be better, because more people would be able to have access to it, which means there would be more voices, which means more creativity. And as Jesse said, you should go to his SoundCloud and hear his creativity, and you should go to Comrade Das Rosie, like we said, dot org. Get involved with your local mutual aid project. Get involved with your local community, housing, tenant association, anything. Just do your part. Uh, find your project and work and, and st- uh, strive towards the liberation of, of all men, of all women, of all human beings across this planet. That's what I have to say. We can do it together. Brothers and sisters, that's your fucking epoch. We're ending this one on a positive and, note. And NBs and uh, whatever. Uh, <laughs> what about the NBs? <laughs> Yeah, I just ran out of like categories. Your thing about finding your whatever made me think of uh, my friend's like thesis photography class show. When Wait I was a second, <laughs> hold on. But, I interrupted Scott. I uh, no, you didn't. You <laughs> I was literally said, done. You never. Do you, did you yeah, say did. enjoy? You said enjoy your epoch. When I said that's your epoch, I ended one on a positive oh, note. That's what okay. I said. Okay. Okay. I literally was done. <laughs> you did well. We did. We did well. <sighs> Done well. I was gonna talk and I just exhaled when I fucking idiot. Anyways, yes, I will watch this in a second. <laughs> Yeah, she's playing oh, a infidel hands, but how would it. your hair fare in <laughs> Mr. President? Mr. President. With your your little um Mr. Umbrella Man. Oh right, that's another news thing. The Biden got confirmed by the Supreme Court. Why am I talking? Or not the Supreme the, Court, you know what I mean? College. <laughs> the electrical oh, Biden college. got approved he got <laughs> Sounds like a fucking, uh, uh, you know, schoolhouse rock thing. The electrical college. The electrical college is like Johnny Five, no disassemble. <laughs> the one thing I remember from schoolhouse rock is conjunction, junction, what's what your function? function? <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah. All right. I'm going to go swan dive off the roof. Because I'm an American B. Oh, no, no, man. I'm an American B. And I'm hoping that the red 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 red